This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and Discord servers, on-screen shout outs, and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. With this week 11 rewatch, there's a lot of things to talk about, but I think one of the most interesting things to talk about with this rewatch is DTR because DTR is somebody that during the season, I thought had some potential based off of what he did in college, based off of what he did in his preseason run. And I was one of those people who was pushing, hey, DTR, if he starts for the rest of the year, that could be something that wouldn't be the worst case scenario. And this is why I think rewatching a game, especially with the mindset, right? And that's what I'm doing with this rewatch series. I want to challenge what I thought coming in. And if you're rewatching with me at home, I want y'all to challenge what you thought coming in. If you thought Deshaun Watson played bad, challenge yourself and look for evidence that proves yourself wrong in the rewatch and vice versa, right? I went into this rewatch thinking, hey, I think Deshaun Watson's play was underrated. During this rewatch, I've been able to point out specific reasons, stats, numbers, highlights on why I believe that because I challenged my own opinion on that to see if it was right. With this rewatch, some of the takes that I've had during the season and have held throughout the offseason have stood up through this rewatch, right? Okay, Miles Garrett, very good. Obviously going to stand up through the rewatch, even if I look for reasons why Miles might have not been good, right? There have been some opinions that have popped up during this rewatch that I didn't necessarily carry before, but really feel strongly about now, right? The the place that Shelby Harris had on this defensive line, the difficulty I think this team is going to have replacing Sione Takitaki and Anthony Walker um, and Obo Okoronkwo being super underrated in what he brings to the Browns defense. Then there are opinions that I felt strongly about during the season, that I look back on on the rewatch now that everything's done, right? I'm not caught up in the energy of the season like we all are. I'm not caught up in the hype of the moment or the energy of the moment. And it's just watching football games. And sometimes when you do that, you run into a take that you have that you're like, wow, I don't know if I believe that anymore. And while this is a game that is a notch in DTR's belt because on paper he beat the Pittsburgh Steelers in one of his first real starts, and he had a good drive at the end of the game to make that happen. And my thing is, if this is what good DTR looks like, and look, we'll watch the rewatch next week against the Denver game where I remember from my recollection off the top of the head, he had more impressive throws and looked like they opened up the playbook a little bit more. If this is anywhere close to what Kevin Stefanski and AVP's plan was for the offense that they're going to run for DTR, this just was not sustainable. The reason I say that is when you watch this game, and you can go back and watch this game, you can go back and watch it any time that DTR is the quarterback, more so than any other quarterback that they put out there, every completion feels like a grind. Like, it just feels like very difficult offense to get. And more concerning to me, DTR seems to be limited on the combination of, of plays he can successfully run in the NFL, right? Like if you need to run a quick slant, he can throw that. If you need to run a stick in the middle of the field, he can throw that. But if you ask him to throw a deep nine, he can't, he can't do that with touch. If you ask him to throw a corner, he can't do that. If you ask him a honey hole corner two, he can't do that. I am trying to say this to be constructive. Some of this stuff can't be fixed, but, I have to be honest. I have to be constructive. I have to tell y'all why I feel this way so you don't think I just had a random change of mind. 
And this brings me to the weird contradiction that is DTR. He's a great athlete. He is special when he runs the ball and he's cutting up. He's a spectacular, a plus plus athlete. His arm talent is one of the weirdest mysteries I've ever I've ever seen from a quarterback in my life. Because he is on one hand capable of throwing the football with incredible zip. Incredible zip that would indicate that he is capable of throwing the ball very far downfield. But almost every time he pushes the ball past 35 yards, it's bad. It's really bad. Um, I'm concerned when I really hone in and watch all of his pass attempts. I wonder, is touch a thing that he has in his arsenal? Like, is that something he can learn down the road? Or is that a thing that he has in his arsenal? Again, I'm not being constructive of DTR on the same scale that I would be of a starting quarterback. The bar is lower than that that I'm measuring DTR. I'm measuring him against being a backup quarterback, right? Can he be a backup quarterback in the NFL? And even some of these things, just what you expect from a backup. You expect a backup to be able to make most of the throws. I did not watch a quarterback I felt like was capable of making most of the throws. He is capable of making some spectacular passes, but is he capable of making the layups that he needs to make? I don't know. It doesn't seem like that comes easy to him. He is the NFL version of a basketball player that shoots well when they're covered, but when they're wide open, you never know what to expect with them. That is what watching this game with DTR was. I was watching this game with DTR and I had the realization that if this was not a rookie that has a lot of intriguing tools and a lot of, I don't want to call it upside, but with those tools, you think that there's a lot of upside there, right? Somebody could run 4-3, somebody could throw the, the seams off of football. And because of that, you're hopeful of what he could become. But if we're just evaluating what he is, he was not even close to being as good as P.J. Walker. Like, P.J. Walker was more capable of making more throws on a more consistent basis. And this is the issue with developmental backup quarterbacks. Maybe this is something with enough reps that DTR could work out. Maybe he can learn touch. Maybe he can figure out how to apply some of that pressure he puts on the football to throw it so damn hard to throw it far down the field inaccurately. Because if he does figure it out, there is a talented quarterback in there for DTR. But if you draft him to be a developmental backup, he's never going to get those reps. So what is he ever going to become? Because these issues that DTR has, in my opinion, kind of make him unplayable. And I know that sounds harsh for somebody that we were super excited about as late as what, November? But I think it's the truth. And if you look at how the Browns have moved this offseason, they brought in Tyler Huntley. They were talking about going after Joe Milton. It feels like that's something that they think, too. Then you add in that DTR already had limitations coming in to the season, right? He already had limitations. We knew that the deep ball stuff was not there for him at UCLA. We knew that the arm, start, arm talent stuff was weird for him at UCLA and even in the preseason. Well, the solution for all of that, my bad, was, well, he's going to play in a Kubiak system. He's not going to be asked to do a ton of that. All he's going to be asked to do is play on time. And his play style is similar to Brock Purdy. So you could see there being a similar transition. But when you watch Brock Purdy and you watch DTR, while they play similarly, what Brock Purdy is great at is hitting layups. He can make a great throw every once in a while, but you're not going to be wild by the throw profile of Brock Purdy. What you are going to be wild by when you watch Brock Purdy is the consistency that he hits his open receivers. 
And that is a skill. There's plenty of times in this game where DTR has an open receiver running it out and he can't get the ball to that player properly and it turns into a to a pass breakup. It turns into an interception. It turns into a mess. Look at what David Njoku did in this game. Absolutely nothing. There were opportunities for David Njoku to do things, but DTR could not hit the layups. And we can blame some of that on the receivers not catching the ball, which I think a lot of us, including myself, went to during the season, right? But when you actually think about it, blaming a receiver for dropping a ball when there is clear evidence that when this quarterback plays, this specific quarterback plays, all of these receivers drop the ball more, right? The drops weren't a problem with P.J. Walker. The drops weren't a problem with Joe Flacco. The drops weren't a problem with Deshaun Watson. But you put DTR in, and all of a sudden, Amari Cooper can't catch. All of a sudden, um, Elijah Moore can't catch. All of a sudden, David Njoku is dribbling footballs like it's 2018. That this is kind of DTR's fault. It almost feels to me like we're blaming the rim for him missing shots. At some point, you just have to admit you can't shoot. And with DTR, wow, all of the tools seem to be there. They don't combine and compile in a way that I feel like is helpful right now. Yes, he can move, but he can't throw on the run to save his life. Um, yes, he can throw the ball really hard, but he can't get the ball downfield. And then you see that he's moved into this offense that's more built around what Josh Allen does, what Deshaun Watson does, what Jameis Winston does, what Cam Newton did. And I just don't see that as a scenario in which DTR is going to thrive. I don't want to say that like just because the offense is changing, just because they're going to be attacking downfield, that there's not a version of that offense that DTR can run. There certainly is a version of the spread that you can put a weak arm quarterback in. Tons of guys have done it. Like that's that's Cliff Kingsbury's claim to fame is spread offenses for weak arm quarterbacks, right? Where you're throwing a ton of screens, you're throwing a ton of tunnels, you're throwing a ton of quick slants, you're throwing like a ton of short routes. There's a version of that offense that exists for a quarterback that does not have the ability to attack downfield, but that is not the most optimal version of that offense. That is not the version of the offense that the Browns are built to thrive with. That That's just kind of what you would have to do if DTR had to play. And I think that it's clear to me, if you look at Tyler Huntley's work, he's much more equipped for that than DTR. Jameis Winston obviously much more equipped for that and Deshaun Watson's the whole reason they're putting that thing together so it makes me wonder where does DTR sit and if DTR and where he sits is even a consideration anymore for the Cleveland Browns because if I'm being honest with you after this rewatch and again maybe my mind changes after the Denver game after I rewatch the Denver game but if I'm Andrew Barry, if I'm in the Browns front office, I see no reason to include DTR in his development in my future plans. That doesn't mean you cut him this year, but it 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 means that you're not going to keep a roster spot just so he can stay on the team. If it so happens that you have to cut him to keep Tyler Huntley, it's just what's going to have to happen. Right now, if you can keep Tyler on the practice squad, then and keep DTR, sure. But I don't know if I see him as a developmental prospect because some of the issues with DTR, they don't feel fixable. Like the arm talent stuff, that does not feel fixable to me. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe those problems are fixable. But I feel like if they were, he would have showed some touch in this game. Like this game happened weeks after that Baltimore game. He had a ton of time to study the playbook, a ton of time to adjust what did and did not work. And touch was a issue in that Baltimore game and touch is an issue in this Pittsburgh game. I don't think it's something he has great control over. I don't think I think he has good arm talent, 
but bad arm control. He's like a pitcher who can't throw his pitch in the strike zone. I feel like in order to talk about DTR, I have to compare him to athletes in other spaces that have physical tools, gifts that would make you believe in them. But for whatever reason, don't have the ability to control those gifts consistently enough to provide what is a compelling play on the field. That's the issue with DTR. That's why my mind has changed with DTR because I watched this offense and I watched it with PJ Walker and I watched it with Deshaun Watson. But I think this is why it feeds into why we were like, oh my God, look at the difference with Joe Flacco. Because if we went from Deshaun Watson to Joe Flacco, I don't know if it's that stark. But going from DTR to Joe Flacco, whoo, stark. It's stark. Going to PJ Walker to, Joe, to DTR is stark. It's stark. It's obvious that this guy just could not effectively run the offense. And I wonder if Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry had that realization and why it feels like there's been a course change in the development of DTR. Like, I don't think Tyler Huntley is here for convenience. I think he's here for a reason. That's an interesting one to me. I thought I'd feel different after this Pittsburgh game about DTR because the more the offseason has gone, the more low I've been on him. I've been thinking, hey, well, I'll watch this Pittsburgh game, be reminded about what he can do, and maybe I'll feel better about him. And I just felt worse. Like, yes, he had that one drive at the end of the game, and there were like two good throws in there, but he threw the ball like 40 times in this game, and there's two decent passes I can look at. And that's not great. And, it, and even in this game, it felt like it was obvious that the Browns offense in this form just was not sustainable. Like this was not going to be sustainable. Um, and they needed Joe Flacco to come in to make sure they can resurrect whatever hopes they had in this season. Because I don't think DTR was capable of, of, of running the offense in a sustainable manner. And Joe Flacco was not consistent, but he was ultimately running the offense at a sustainable level. I think that is my largest takeaway from this game. It has to be about DTR. And that's where I am on him. Like this rewatch has really, really changed my mind on him. Also, another thing that I've said for a while, and it continues to be true during this rewatch, the Browns defense carried this team, right? Like, no matter who's at quarterback, the Browns defense is the number one reason that they win any game that they win this season. Like, number two could be Deshaun Watson. It could be Joe Flacco. It could be maybe Jerome Ford has a good game or it's Amari Cooper, right? Number two changes a lot during this season. But number one reason why the Browns won any game is the defense. You look at the Browns, they scored one touchdown in this game. How did they score that one touchdown in this game? Yeah, the Browns get a near safety that leads to a super short field, which leads to the Browns' only touchdown of the day. So the Browns' only touchdown, the defense has a huge assistant. That is just what happened this year. The defense was that good. And again, no matter what quarterback's jersey you bought, no matter what quarterback you root for, we have to understand that what happened last year, while the quarterbacks assisted at times, number one reason you won any game you won, the defense. It's why I find these assertions that the Browns are going to be bad because Deshaun Watson's come back into the starting lineup kind of silly. Not because I think Deshaun Watson's going to bounce back and win the MVP or anything this year, but because the Browns kind of proved last year what they built. This defense is strong enough to withstand a lot of different levels of quarterback play. The Browns defense bailed out the Browns offense late in this game in the third quarter when DTR throws a interception on a short field that he got because of a roughing the passer because of a combination of a bad punt and a roughing the passer penalty. He throws an interception on the 30. Browns defense forces a three and out and then forces a bad punt. The Browns get the ball again at the 50. Like, the defense, and I cannot state this enough, 
always the reason the Browns won last year. You can say they're the reason why they lost too in the games that they lost. Sure. But they're always the reason why they won. That was the best unit on the team by far. Now, let me talk about Pittsburgh because I do have some interesting things to say about Pittsburgh in this game. I think a lot of conversation about Pittsburgh has been about their quarterback situation. I don't really care about their quarterback situation. If Russ starts, if Justin Fields starts, I don't think they're that different of a team than they were last year with Kenny Pickett. I don't think the story at the Pittsburgh Steelers is going to come down to who's playing quarterback for them. I don't think it matters. The Pittsburgh Steelers and their ability to win games are going to be about their offensive line, their run game, and their defense. That's going to determine if the Pittsburgh Steelers win games or not. Whether Russ is handing the ball off to whoever's running the ball or whether Justin Fields handing that ball off, it does not matter. Now, the question is, for me, does Russ's presence change how you attack on offense? It's always been a question. Because with Russ there, there is pressure to throw the ball a lot more. With Justin Fields, there's not. With Russ, there's pressure to throw the ball more. The reason I think that's important is because I think Jalen Warren is a really good running back. The Browns in both games versus the Pittsburgh Steelers could not do a thing about Jalen Warren. Couldn't do a thing about him. Every big play that the Steelers had on offense came down to two people. George Pickens, Jalen Warren. Literally every big play that they had against the Browns this year came down to those two players. And while I don't think Najee Harris is a bad football player, I do think Najee Harris is a very, very average football player. And what I mean by that is any play that Najee Harris gets 13 yards, I feel like if you put Jalen Warren in, he gets 23. Like, yes, Najee is capable of taking advantage and making plays when plays are there for him to be made. But you feel like if Jalen Warren was in the game, it would have been much worse. Like whenever the Browns in any of the games versus Pittsburgh give up a five or 10 yard run to Najee, I take a deep breath of relief because I'm like, good thing Jalen wasn't in because if Jalen Warren was in, that could have been a touchdown. That could have been a big play. He could have took advantage of that. I think Jalen Warren is better at breaking tackles than Najee Harris. I think he's faster as a running back. There's literally nothing I think Najee Harris does better than Jalen Warren. And the question for Pittsburgh isn't who they're going to start at quarterback. It's how much are they going to run the ball and who are they going to run the ball with? If Pittsburgh decides to focus their game on running the ball a lot with Jalen Warren and a little bit with Najee Harris, they will be a playoff team. If Pittsburgh decides to get caught up in the rust trap, caught up in the Najee trap because you drafted him in the first round and continues to make Jalen Warren a side character on this offense, they're going to struggle like they did last year. Maybe they make the playoffs. Maybe they don't. The defense is good. They seem to have good luck, but they're not going to be that harmful of of a team but I think Jalen Warren has some real potential there at running back that is being underutilized and you know I think for Pittsburgh it's a question of like who do you prioritize and that's why I think the Russ signing could be an issue because to me if you're signing Russ it's because you think that he might be able to still be Russ and if you want to find out if he can still be Russ well you're going to throw the ball a lot I don't know if that's good for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I remember saying a similar thing with Ben Roethlisberger and Pittsburgh Steelers fans. They they got mad at me, but I ended up being right about this, right? When Ben Roethlisberger came back from that injury, I put out the question of saying, hey, I know you guys are saying if they just do what they did with Mason Rudolph and Duck and they just do that with Big Ben, that's going to be an upgrade and they're going to be a better football team. That was literally word for word. The same take you're hearing now about Kenny Pickett versus Russell Wilson um, and Justin Fields is the same take that they had when they were like, hey, we're going to be such a better team with Ben Roethlisberger because he's going to be an upgraded quarterback and we're just going to do the same exact thing that we did last year, but with better quarterback play. But what happened with Ben Roethlisberger and the pressure with Ben is much different than it is with Russ, but the pressure still exists with Russ. 
with Ben Roethlisberger in there, they decide to throw the ball 40 times, more than you would imagine a team to throw the ball 40 times that was not good at throwing it. And that really affected their offense. That's the same effect I worry about Russ having on the scene because I've seen it happen with Pittsburgh multiple times before. So with Pittsburgh, I watch this game and I think to myself, man, they could have beat the Browns if they just ran Jalen Warren a couple times more. Because Browns really didn't have a great answer for it. Let me get back to a mini DTR film breakdown to kind of support what I'm saying and why my opinion has changed on DTR in this. And I'll show you guys a few plays that kind of illustrate some of the points that I'm talking about in this video. So this play right here. And you see that on the surface and you're like, okay, he took the screen, that's fine. But then let's look at what you did not get, right? Because he's so, he wants to get rid of the ball so quickly. He does not see the field a lot, and this is part of it. And this might change with him being a rookie, but watch David and Joku on this, right? He gets to the top of his drop, and David David's there for the stick route, and David's a much more dangerous runner with the football. That's a minor miss, but it's a miss, right? You could have got David on stick. I'm pretty sure that's why they run that action. Right here, this play, and again, you can look at this play and blame David Njoku, right? Because he got his hands on the football. But, man, that ball is going all of, like, what, eight yards in the air? There's no reason for it to be that high. Like, I get the frustration with the wide receiver if he touches a football and it's downfield and he cannot catch it. Because if you're a wide receiver in that situation, you should not be expecting a perfect ball. So you should make some adjustment. But if you are within the first 10 yards of a play, five yards and within five yards of the line of scrimmage, you should expect a relatively well-thrown football. And if you don't throw a relatively well-thrown football on one of those plays, you're going to get a tip ball interception eventually. Um, so, yeah, you can try to blame this on David. I don't think it really sells for me because this throw is just unacceptable at this distance. And look how much damage can happen if you just miss that throw. You got to hit the layups, right? Um, right here, let's see what happens. This is the one where he misses Atkins. No, this is just another bad throw. And again... There's just less leniency for inaccuracy when you're throwing the ball this close to the line of scrimmage. Now, this is what, within 10 of the line of scrimmage? This just has to be an accurate football. Downfield, some leniency. Like, if he threw this corner, this post route to Amari Cooper on this side of the field, and he misses it, okay, whatever. It's downfield. There's, like, one person there. It's whatever. But here, there's, like, Three stillers that can crash onto that ball if it's popped in the air. That just has to be an accurate football. Like, Elijah Moore should not have to jump to catch this football. That needs to be an accurate football consistently. And consistently, it was inaccurate for him. Another play. I think this is where he misses uh, Jordan Atkins. Yes. So you look at this play, you're like, oh, cool, completion. And then Elijah Moore gets a little bit extra, and you get a first down, and it looks like a good play. But what it covers up is a huge mistake here, right? Jordan Atkins, watch him, the tight end right here on the end, covering up the tackle, Dewan Jones. So what you get here is what you've been trying to get all game against Pittsburgh, right? Pittsburgh runs the heaviest amount of base defense, three linebackers of any team. So what you try to do is force Pittsburgh to have their linebackers in coverage and get a mismatch. You finally get that mismatch with Jordan Atkins right here, right? So you get this linebacker trying to pick up Jordan Atkins, and you could just tell right here, if DTR is looking right here, he should know immediately off that angle that linebacker is taking – off the body language of that linebacker. This is going to be a hit here, right? And then you see 29 creep up 
into Cedric Tillman, which means, oh, this window's wide open, right? Look at look at uh, Jordan Atkins. Wide open window there. He's expecting the football the second he turns. Doesn't get the football because DTR is just either he's hesitant or he just doesn't even ever peep it, right? Like he just – he looks left and he glances here on this side of field and he just never peeps that, that linebacker is doing exactly what they want him to do, Right? Like exactly, they're flowing exactly with the way the defense he wants to do. It's almost like he checked and saw the linebacker was moving up and it was like, oh, I can't throw that check down. Let me throw this check down. Well, that's not check down, but let me throw this short pass. Like this, this was there. This was so there, right? And it was, it was there pretty immediately. So there's no excuse why he didn't see this. This one is an example of a play that, like, this this isn't DTR's fault, right? Like, this is a good ball. David Njoku just simply does not catch this, right? Which is why you can give him some grace from some areas. But for every play like that, there's more plays where he's missing stuff, right? And it's easy to get caught up, and I think we all did. And, hey, he's, he's not playing that badly. These guys are dropping passes around him and looking at the drop numbers and getting um, – caught up in that was your analysis but when you look at it it's just like what's that these are easy throws man these are 10 yard throws like and th- now I want to make this sound like that's a layup that's not a layup but it's a shot he should make right like that that's an NFL throw you're going to be expected to make 10 times a game man right here Okay, so he throws this ball to David and Joker. Again, when you're watching the game, you're like, hey, yay, completion. But when you watch the film, watch Elijah Moore, right? On the outside here next to the 40 on the top of your screen. Elijah Moore, he's running it out, and you get exactly what you want. Again, I'm not saying, oh, he popped open late. Look at him. No, 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 no. Watch the whole process of the play. Because sometimes people will screenshot a player, right? And be like, oh, he was open. But they don't show the process, and you're like, oh, there's no way the quarterback would have saw that early enough to make a decision. Here, he should have been able to see this, right? Early in the play, you look at Elijah Moore, and boom, wins off the line of scrimmage, he gets a free run. So automatically, you're you're processing this, and you're like, okay, you know Elijah is running it out. Where's Elijah cutting that out? At the 50. So Elijah's cutting this out at the 50. You see that the way that this DB is coming out, he is worried about that check down he's worried about is that Cedric Tillman right you see this linebacker holding middle of the field maybe waiting for David Njoku or he's going to chase Elijah Moore either way he's too late um, and nobody is in that part of the field if your DTR you should have your eyes on this the second you see the free release especially after you see a pretty contested release here with the with Amari Cooper right you see a pretty contested release there on that right side and again, his eyes are where they're supposed to be at the beginning of this play. They're looking over there, and he just goes off of it. He never sees it. He just goes off. Look, he goes off of that, and he throws in the middle of the field, which is fine. But then look where Elijah Moore is. You get that ball to him on time and rhythm, he could get to the 40. This is what I mean when I'm like, the offense just looks so hard for him and the Cleveland Browns in this game because this is the stuff that makes the offense look easy, right? When you're just taking that easy completion. Throwing that to Elijah Moore. It's a tough ball, but it's the NFL. You should be able to make a tough throw. But instead, he has to like zip this thing in the gut of David and Joker between two defenders just to get that first down when there was a much easier completion available. And that's kind of what happens with DTR. Like, I remember Mark Sanchez had this line that I ridiculed when I first heard it, but now I kind of understand it, where he's like, oh, DTR is doing trick shots. This is what he means. There's easier throws available, but because of his limitations, he has to throw some of these crazy passes in order to get the ball, to get a completion, because he just doesn't have universal arm talent in a way that like other quarterbacks do he can't make all the throws 
here this ball is late to Amari Cooper. So, like, at least he's, like, trying to process and see and wait. And then again, this is rookie stuff. But it's like, it just, I don't know if he's processing that well. It's late. It almost gets picked off. It should have got picked off. And it would have been a pick six. And then here. This is another one where he's just, it's just getting too predictable. I mean, look, look how much, look how little fear the Steelers have of anything. And again, if you just wait for this to process, look at, Look at uh, Jordan Atkins right here on the top of your screen at the 40 below Amari Cooper. Watch him, and you're going to see he beats his linebacker, right? Boom, beats him. He should be waiting for that. But instead, he just he wants to get rid of this ball super quickly. He doesn't want to see what happens. And instead of seeing, oh, Jordan Atkins beat his man. I got a seam shot right here. He just throws this little, this this predictable out. Now out this predictable curl to Amari Cooper, and that's it. It's going to be pretty easy to block right there, right? He he just he was so locked into one option, and again, to be lenient, maybe this has to do with him being a rookie. But I would expect more out of a rookie that you expect within the first four years of their contract to be a backup quarterback. Like, this is concerning, to be honest with you. Because the one thing you expect rookies to do, right, like, you you don't expect a rookie to be a maestro when it comes to the pre-snap, post-snap stuff in, in the beginning of their career. But the one thing you do want your rookies to be is instinctual still, right? Like, use some of those instincts that made you play well in college and just play football. And knowing that Jordan Atkins is going to be open here is not pre-snap genius. It's just playing football. Okay, it looks like we got a linebacker on my tight end. Let me see what that looks like. Let me see what that release looks like. Does he win? Oh, he won? Let me throw it to him. That's just football, right? A lot of this stuff that I'm pointing out is just playing football, and he's not doing it, right? Like, this is the stuff that rookies should get big plays on, and they shouldn't be consistent on the other stuff where they normally aren't consistent on. But this kind of stuff rookies should be good at. This is just playing football. He's played a lot of football in college. And this one just inaccurate behind Amari Cooper. Yeah, you could blame Cooper for technically dropping this one. But, like, again, short passes, they can't be inaccurate because this is what happens. And DTR was begging for something like that to happen all game. But that's a little mini film breakdown to kind of get why watching this game was on top of the Baltimore game. Just kind of a, 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 a perspective-changing experience for me. To the Browns now. We talked about how great the defense was. We talked about how this rewatch has really belittled my faith in DTR. And look, I don't want to sound like I don't understand some of the things that DTR was working through in this game. David and Joku and Amari Cooper, whether their drop passes were DTR's fault or not, still weren't having their best games. Even though I thought Amari Cooper did have a pretty nice game. He was on tape cooking. Um, was it Joey Porter Jr.? especially on the inside whenever he wanted it, but they just could not get the ball to him on a consistent basis, at least accurately. So maybe just David and Joku had a bad game here because there were some catchable passes that David most certainly didn't catch. And I think he was pretty frustrated with himself at the end of this one. It's not hard to look and find reasons on why DTR did not play well in this game that aren't expressly and exclusively his fault, but it's harder to find reasons why you would be intrigued going forward with DTR outside of his physical potential as a quarterback, his athletic ability and things that have nothing to do with what he actually put on tape. And that is the concern that I have with DTR after doing a reevaluation of the bulk of his work for 2023 is I was somebody who wanted it to happen. You know, I was rooting for DTR towards the end of the season to figure it out because I thought he had a lot of potential. My question is, my realization is that 
it is it seems like a much steeper hill to climb for him to achieve that potential than I originally thought. And now the offense is changing. Now what we're asking from the quarterback is changing. And it's moving away from the stuff that he does do well, throwing the ball on time, getting the ball out quickly. If that's the case, I have my concerns about his fit on this team going forward. But that's my thoughts on the rewatch. This was a little different. I didn't go play by play as much in this one because I feel like the more interesting conversation is less about what happens in the play by play of this game. This was a 13 to 10 ball game. There was not much interesting happening in the play by play. Miles Garrett was amazing. The Browns defense was amazing. The Browns secondary is amazing and run support in this game. All of that stuff has been said before. But what is interesting about this game is the evaluation of DTR after him getting a fair chance to start. And that's what I want to focus on. I hope that doesn't bother you guys, but y'all have a great day. Have an even better night. Peace. He gets 23. Like, yes, does Najee do some? Girl, you got to chill. <laughs>